Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, May 22nd, 2021. And our top story this week, a new blood test for the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Dr. Michael Blaha. He's Director of Clinical Research at the Chickaroni Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Blaha, Michael, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Yeah, my pleasure to join you again. Let's, uh, so, you know, when we first, we've been chatting over the past several months about cardiovascular disease and ways to improve your outcome, whether you're a young person, a middle-aged person, a, a mature person. And, you know, today we want to talk about a test that it, exi it exists, uh, a, a great test to help identify whether you are predisposed to getting cardiovascular disease and what you may need to do as a clinician to treat that. Uh, but many people may not be aware of this test. So uh, fill us in. What, what is this lipoprotein A test? Yeah, the lipoprotein A test is a blood test, and it measures the amount of so-called lipoprotein A that you have in your bloodstream. It turns out that lipoprotein A is a subfraction of our LDL cholesterol. I think we're all familiar with so-called bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. Well, lipoprotein A is a subfraction of that, but it's particularly bad for you. And what's interesting about it is it's almost entirely genetically determined. So your levels are pretty much constant throughout life. What makes it really interesting is that a lot of people have very low levels of lipoprotein A. But some people have extraordinarily high levels. So the, the levels vary greatly throughout the population. And this tends to run in families. It helps to explain a lot of premature disease in families that don't have a lot of risk factors. So some patients can have, or 80% of patients will have sort of normal values. But 20% will have values that can be tenfold higher than the normal range. And we know definitively from research studies that this is linked to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, both heart attack and stroke. Uh, Michael, in, in terms of are, are clinicians in general, you, you go to your primary care physician, he or she, are they aware of this test? Do they typically do this? Is this part of the uh, cholesterol screening that you and I would normally get it at our annual physical? Yeah, important. that's an important question. It's not. And I would say some primary care doctors know about this, and many do not, because this has been a development maybe in the last 10 years that's really made a big difference, and not everyone trained thinking about lipoprotein A. So you do need a separate uh, uh, test for it. It's the same blood draw, but the, a separate doctor has to order it separately. Um, and the test comes back independent of a normal cholesterol profile. So you might say, well, who should get it? Well, first of all, I tend to recommend it in patients who have a family history of heart disease um, because it helps to explain a lot of people who have a family history of heart disease. Or if they have, for example, early disease themselves, like I say a high calcium score, but not a lot of risk factors, they don't know why, it helps to explain that. And um, other times, just other people with a, what we call uh, severe cholesterol abnormalities. It's very abnormal cholesterol values. We like to check this too. It tends to be abnormal in concert, sometimes with other values. So family history, premature disease, severe uh, cholesterol abnormalities, those people should get it. But I'll tell you, there's a movement up front by several societies, including, let's say, the National Lipid Association and others. It says maybe we should do this and everyone at least one time in their lives since the values don't change. It doesn't need to be checked all the time. Maybe we should just check it once in everyone. So this is emerging. At least the patients I mentioned should have it measured. And maybe really anyone who's concerned about their risk maybe should check it one time. So these, these t usually tests are associated with some, some type of therapy or, or potential therapy. Is there research or being conducted around how to treat this particular lipoprotein if it's elevated? Um, and, and where do those trials stand? Yeah, that's a great question. So the patients always ask me that. Well, you're <laughs> going to check this, but if it's high, what are you going to do about it? Right now, all we do is to treat your risk factors more aggressively. We'll use a higher dose of a step. We'll try to get your LDL even lower, control the blood pressure better, which is a little unsatisfying. So right now it's sort of like a risk marker. It's just another risk marker that we use to identify early disease. But, but therapies are on the way, we think. So in phase three clinical trials now, we have uh, so-called antisense oligonucleotides, basically that go in and ramp down your LP little A production by 
so they can lower LPO to LA dramatically. And we think this is going to be beneficial, particularly in the people with very high values. We won't know for about two to four more years how successful this strategy is, but those uh, those uh, strategies and those therapies are coming. If they're successful, it's going to be wide open. I think we're going to recommend this test to everyone. So uh, it's, a, it's an area that I think we should be aware of. Uh, people with high cardiovascular risk should be aware of now to start identifying families that tend to have high values because eventually we'll better treat it directly. And I guess last question, how are these therapies or how could these therapies be used in conjunction with some of the other things we've discussed over your last few appearances? For example, exercise, the importance of exercise, reducing your weight line, weight, waistline, excuse me, weight loss, and also the use of statins, which we've talked about. Are, are these, is it a complementary, progressive approach uh, to implementing these types of therapies? Yeah, that's a good point. Of course, they don't, therapies like this that are coming don't replace diet and exercise and statins, which are the cornerstone of therapy. The nice thing about these, uh, these therapies, they'll be more like precision therapies. We'd only give them to people with very high levels of lipoprotein A. So they would be kind of just for select patients who have high values, we potentially give these on top of recommending diet and exercise. But this is why this area is important. You can lower your, let's say, blood pressure by losing weight and exercising more. But it turns out you can't lower your LP little A, lipoprotein A value by diet and exercise. It's genetically determined. So this is something where it like calls for a therapy. This we've been waiting this for this for a long time. So what I'd recommend is that if you're high cardiovascular risk, you have a family history, maybe talk to your doctor about a lipoprotein A test, adding that to your cholesterol profile. And that's where we use it now. And just be aware if you have a high values that therapies might be coming uh, that might lower those values in, in concert with all the other things that we talked about, which was diet, exercise, maybe a statin, and maybe an aspirin, uh, depending on your situation. And, and just an aside, doctor, I know I, I said the last question was the last question, but we have time for, of course, one more. There's this amazing medical breakthroughs. We've talked with folks from obviously yourself at Johns Hopkins, but MIT, there's a lot of different therapies where you can actually, they've sequenced DNA and able to shunt. And again, I'm not a doctor, never, nowhere close to an operating room. I wouldn't be caught dead, pun intended, doing that, uh, afraid of blood. But, but there are a lot of uh, therapies underway and approaches underway to shunt some of these really horrific diseases and, and, you know, more to be expected will be coming. And, and this just increases our longevity and our quality of life, which is why we're covering on this program. That's right. Um, I, I think a lot of the therapies that you're seeing, the genetic ones that you mentioned, the one that I'm talking about here today, are really aimed at the people that develop premature disease. And that's really the biggest problem, right? We want to stop those heart attacks that are can be fatal or life-changing that happen at age 45, 50 in at-risk men or, or women. Those are, are particularly affecting our, you know, longevity, as you mentioned, our quality of life, our productive years. So these are the kind of therapies I think that can make a difference for those, you know, those families that come to me and say, everyone in my family's had a heart attack, the males at least, in their 50s. And I want to do something about that um, because, uh, you know, they might have extremely short lifespans or develop heart failure based on heart attacks. So, so I think it's really going to make a big difference for select patients. Um, and we're really excited about that. Thanks, Michael. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And when we come back, We'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy.
featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit Repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. On Monday, I sat down with Bloomberg Law's Austin Ramsey to discuss 401k plan data being fair game. Let's take a look. As you know, as a lot of people who have been studying this space know, within the last couple of years, really five years, we have seen an explosion in uh, employers having an interest in providing what, what, what they call financial wealth programs. Um, and those kind of extend beyond what you would think of as long-term retirement or health savings to emergency savings, helping an employer pay off um, student loan debt, things like that, even counseling on, on how to budget, household budgeting. Um, and as, we, as we've seen this explosion in financial wealth programs, we've also seen a lot of litigation questioning the way that third party service providers, those companies that your company is hiring to provide retirement products to you, um, the way that they use data to cross sell those kinds of products to you. And so as we see this rise in litigation, as we see this rise in financial wellness, I think my article is exploring the idea that, you know, look, we know that the Department of Labor is interested in looking in, into these kinds of areas. They've already released guidance on cybersecurity issues. They've already redefined the role of a fiduciary just, you know, last year under a Republican administration. So, you know, it's very likely, I think, that the Department of Labor is not done talking about this issue, and we could see more regulatory uh, action or guidance soon. You know, retirement companies are collecting an enormous amount of data on you. It's, it goes well beyond just your name to your income level, to your social security number, to contribution levels, to what your retirement aspects are going to look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, and that data is important. I mean, it informs third party service providers like record keepers or custodians about how best to advise you on how to save, you know, how to build that nest egg. But, you know, as we're providing that kind of data to them, right now there there isn't a lot of reg there is there isn't a lot of rules as to how those companies can use that data. So um you know, a lot of the litigation that I mentioned, it has focused on on whether or not data is quote a plan asset. And when we talk about a plan asset, usually what we're what 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 we're what we're talking about are, are investments. That's the money, the dollars and cents that you put into the account and that you allow to grow. Um, and court after court after court here has said, look, this is not a plan asset. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hold value. That doesn't mean that, you know, a record keeper and your employer shouldn't be negotiating about the value that it has. And here's why. There's nothing, you know, sans a contract that prevents a third party uh, company from selling that data to somebody else like a marketer or something like that. So I think what's really important, what's what's most important, in fact, is that participants and beneficiaries need to start having conversations with their employers or, uh, you know, past employers 
about, you know, what data is collected on them and how that data is used. And then it, the employers themselves need to be negotiating in the contract what ways the data can be used. Uh, I think it's important that you mentioned the California Protection Act there. Um, they actually were able, I, I was able, I had the opportunity to, to talk with the attorney who worked with the attorney general in California to, uh, to carve out uh, financial advisors from, uh, from that act. So in California, at least these kinds of, um, you know, IRA, IRA rollovers, you know, rolling over from an ERISA covered plan into an IRA, those kinds of conversations and the data that's used for them are usually covered by your employer's general disclosure. You know, in California right now, um, uh, your employer or anybody who's collecting data on you has to disclose to you at one point, at one point, they have to disclose to you the data that they've collected. Um, you know, that can come in the form of an email, that can come in the form of, you know, an, an online uh, 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 platform. But once they've met, made that disclosure, the, um, the third parties that have access to that, uh, to that data as part of the contract that your employer has negotiated, um, they don't have to make negotiate or they don't have to make disclosures. And more importantly, um, they can continue to, they can kind of continue a chain, uh, one company to another company to another company marketing to you, you know, high interest credit cards, um, life insurance, IRA rollovers, everything. And this week, I also spoke with MillionAcres.com editor Deidre Woolard about employer and employee differences in opinion on the return to work. Let's take a look. I am still on the fence about this, and I'm wondering how long it's going to last and how it's going to play out over time. And part of that is the inequality of having some people from home and some people in the office. I feel like that's going to be a situation that really needs to be worked out. And now with the mask mandates lifted, we've got kind of another uh, bit of a legal issue of can employers require people to be vaccinated? Can employers, you know, need to see a vaccine card before letting people back in? Are are employees going to be concerned if, you know, if their coworkers are or are not vaccinated? There's so much happening in this space right now and so many questions still to be answered. And so much of it is going to be about how we all react to the new sort of maskless world. I've heard anecdotally, a lot of people are unsure. They're not sure if they trust their fellow citizens who say may say they're vaccinated, but there's not proof. You know, there's been a lot of talk about vaccine passports and if that's necessary for travel. St we're still needing to wear masks on planes, but what if that changes? How do we ensure safety without trampling on human rights and, and you know, and people's ability to move freely. So there's there's really a lot going on and so much of it depends on how we interact as as people and how much we trust each other. This is a this is a Pandora's box. It's not going to be shut. You can't <laughs> tell people that they can work from home for a year and then change the rules on them. It, there was a survey from Robert Half that said that people would be willing to quit over this issue. People really want that flexibility. They don't want to commute anymore. They realize how much time they have with their families, you know, even to do more work. They're even okay with the fact that working from home tends to mean that you're working outside of work hours from time to time. Even that isn't enough to drive people back to the office. So you've really got an issue where the employees are going to demand this in many cases, and employers may have to figure out ways to make this more palatable. Well, the interesting thing about human behavior is that we have relatively short memories. So <laughs> right now, we're basically dealing with we love working from home. We've forgotten what we liked about the office pretty much because it's been over a year. So as we go back, it's really up to the employer to kind of make that situation more, more collaborative, offer certain things that employees might like, you know, the, some of the usual perks of, you know, game rooms, fitness rooms, things like that. But they're really going to have to make it appealing for people. For years, a central business district has been a place where rents tend to be higher, tends to be more desirable properties. If that shifts and work is more centered around suburban office parks and things like that, that changes the investment thesis for a lot of these office REITs. And we're starting to see some talk of office conversions of, you know, converting to multifamily and things like that. 
But there is a real risk that we start hollowing out those central business districts. And that really starts to change the nature of what makes a city dynamic. Well, the other question I have is, is this generational? So you and I are of a generation, we're not digital natives. So we've we're accustomed to contact being face to face. Younger people, digital natives, they may be more comfortable with not face to face because that's what they've grown up with. You see like high school kids, they could be in the same room with each other and they're communicating via via their phones. So there's a difference by, exactly, there's a difference generationally that I'm concerned about as well. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, all in one place. That's right, all in one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. We're back again tomorrow for BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news this week in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more. You're not going to want to miss it. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.